You are tuned into Box Story. My name is Rack Noble. Today we're in South London Churchill's Boxing Gym. I'm with former IBO world champion Hannah Rankin. Hannah, tell us how you're doing. I'm doing well, thank you. Just finished training, so yeah, feeling good. Good, 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 good. How the training goes today, and uh, what you got in the pipeline? Training was really good. Um, we've just been working on some new stuff in the gym. Uh, I've got my next fight coming up on the 12th of March in Cape Town, South Africa, which is really exciting. Uh, very happy to be out, very blessed to get an opportunity to get out as well. Um, so yeah, just working towards that. It's three weeks today. Three weeks today, ah. So 21 days, we'll be there in no time. We'll get onto that in a moment, but I just want to first of all talk about 2020. How did you find training in 2020? Because of course, 2020, the gyms were down, the pandemic was around. Lots of fighters, their careers got put on ice. But you seem to actually be quite busy and things didn't really seem to change too much. Just tell us a bit about that. No, I was very lucky during the pandemic to have access to gym. Obviously, being an elite level athlete, I still had access to training. And um, I chose to use the time to sort of level up my abilities and my skills. And I think that was really important that I had a focus and a goal because... Yeah, I was actually one of those few fighters that was lucky enough to fight twice last year. I fought just before the pandemic started in February. I stopped a former um, welterweight world champion, um, Eva Bajek. Um, and then after that, I was just training in the gym and working towards things. And then later on in the year, the Savannah Marshall fight came up um, at the end of October. So um, that's the, that was my second fight of the year. So I was really lucky to actually be that active and have the opportunity to train. Yeah, I was going to say, two fights in a year, in a year that most fighters didn't get none in. So, very fortunate. I know the gym you was at was, remained open. You was able to get down here and do your bits and pieces. So, moving on to three weeks' time, you're versing Endo Bayini in South Africa, which I found quite ironic in that you're the away fighter from England going to South Africa to be the home fighter, yeah. where the fighter who is from home is going to be the away fighter. Yeah. Uh, tell us about this fight and what else to expect. I hear you're also coming down in weight. Absolutely. So this is my my first sort of uh, route down to the welterweight division. Really excited and just look buzzing to be joining that division. I think it's going to be great. Um, I'm fighting, yeah, Ender Bayani. She's a two-weight South African champion. But yes, I will be the home fighter because my manager, Sam Kinnock, who's an absolute legend, has been working really hard behind the scenes uh, with a company called Fight Africa. And they're looking to bring boxing back to South Africa and have a great connection with Scotland as well. So um, the, the whole idea is to get fighters out uh, f at the moment, currently Scottish fighters, we can go over there to fight and within under the Kinnock stable. And then hopefully later in the future, the African fighters can come over to Scotland to fight as well. Um, obviously we always have problems normally. I've tried to have fighters come from over there um, before, but there's always problems with visas. So we're trying to cre create a great connection and relationship um, because there's an absolute wealth of talent in the whole of Africa and uh, just one that I'm looking forward to working with basically. So your management is looking to bridge the gap between African boxing and Scottish boxing per se and make things a bit more easier for the future. Absolutely and uh, you know yeah it's amazing like Sam's chosen to look outside the box during this time I think obviously the pandemic's made everybody have to think about things to try and get uh, fighters busy and get us out so massive props to him for looking outside the box and getting it sorted. So you said this will be your first fight down at 147 Waterweight a really interesting point as well about this fight is that you're fighting in prison yeah you're going to jail yeah <laughs> tell us about that <laughs> so i'm fighting in the polesmore correctional unit um which is a yeah it's a prison in cape town and i think nelson mandela spent some time there as well which is pretty cool actually um but yeah it's going to go down as one of the strangest places i've boxed i mean even after doing my de debut in a nightclub in south end <laughs> um this is just definitely the weirdest one but I think it's probably got something to do with the COVID situation so they can actually keep us in the bubble there um, and they have a good venue for boxing. I think uh, the correctional unit has quite a big history of boxers coming out of it. So yeah, no, it's uh, it's quite exciting. Will there be inmates watching you box? I don't know, actually. I, I really don't know. I'm assuming we don't have an audience as obviously with the current COVID situation, but you never know. I mean, it'd be great to have a crowd. Why not? I guess a crowd is better than no crowd, but uh, take what you can get. <laughs> So your fight is on the 12th of March and I was saying before, 12th of March, not 12th of March, March is actually a very big month for women's boxing because there's actually quite a few high profile fights. We've got Bracus McCaskill rematch, we've got Declare versus Clarissa Shields undisputed title, uh, we've got yourself Endo Yini, we've got Amanda Serrano versus um, Bermudez, we've even got a heavyweight Daniel Perkins who's looking yeah. to make waves and win the WBC silver title. So. 
lots going on in women's boxing how does it feel to be part of that boom because every fight in itself is um is an attraction is an attraction main event level fight and yeah you're part of that yeah no it, it's really exciting and i think 2020 was really the year that women's boxing like literally made uh, an entrance onto the, the main stage and that's massive thank you to eddie hearn and matchroom boxing especially in sky sports for just putting on these high profile women's fights and, and getting the british public uh, aware of us as fighters you know because I think before that we weren't really household names and then now we've got people like Terry Harper, Natasha Jonas, um, uh, Carly Skelly, Amy Timlin, Savannah Marshall, myself. We're all at that sort of the front line now and people are actually talking about us um, at home and you know it's just great to hear us becoming household names and hopefully inspiring the next generation. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, I'm excited to see where, once the pandemic hopefully eases off, I'll be excited to see if women's fights continue on that trajectory. Yeah, definitely, because like seeing this month or next month alone, we have two undisputed championship bouts. We have fighters going over to foreign countries to headline the event. Uh, we have a heavyweight, we have multi-weight world champions, we have pay-per-view headliners. I think your fight's pay-per-view yep. um Chris clarissa's fight oh, yeah. is also pay-per-view so women literally just stealing the show and running away with it in 2021 so i definitely feel the next generation of female boxers coming through have a lot to aim for have a lot to look up to have a lot to idolize themselves around and i think you guys are doing a great job in doing that oh, thanks moving on well another question which can escalate on from that is representation and um marketing and sponsoring yourself you seem to have quite a lot of people behind you quite a lot of backing and what's quite ironic is that I've seen fighters out there who have way, way larger followers on Instagram and social media, but they haven't got the backing that you've gotten. How have you managed to manoeuvre and market yourself to be in a position where they're giving all the sponsorship to you? <laughs> well, I've had to work really, really hard for that. Um, I think it's something that most fighters should be spending a little bit more time on is their social media presence. Um, unfortunately, we are in a day and age where social media is such a massive part of life. Um, whether you like it or you hate it or whatever, it's part of life. And um, like I've always said, boxing, it comes into that sort of 50% sport category, 50% entertainment industry. And the 50% entertainment industry requires us to sell ourselves and, you know, sell your personality um, and ultimately be able to sell tickets. That's what promoters want to see is that you can sell tickets. Um, right when I started out boxing, um, like I just couldn't get any any sort of sponsorship at all like my coach would phone people up you know like the usual sort of building firms or scaffolding firms that sponsor the guys quite a lot and say oh I've got this great fighter she and they were like oh we're not interested she's a woman <laughs> like just they're not interested um, but now I think especially after this last year that that has really turned on its head um, I I think obviously my background in classical music and performing and stuff it means that I've got quite a lot of other talents to offer I suppose so like I brought big companies on board to sponsor me for yes the social media time and advertising but also I go in and I'll do talks uh, for their women's groups and um, you know confidence building talks and various other things like that so uh, yeah you know you've got to look outside the box you've got to see what you can offer a company before they can like because obviously somebody just giving you money is a mad idea like you know when I was thinking about it I was like I don't want to ask people for money when I first started I thought this is awful I it's, awkward, it's awkward to ask for people for money especially yeah. large amounts exactly but there are so many people out there that just want to support like support um sports people and give us that chance um and so yeah I think look outside the box see what you can offer them and um yeah no I think that's why I've got some great great sponsors massive thank you to all of them as well to be funded to do what you love to do best by external companies around you, where your rent's being paid for and all your facilities are being paid for, is is an amazing opportunity. And many, many fighters don't ever get that or don't receive those kind of benefits. So, yeah, it's very fortunate that you've worked yourself into a position where you can now strive off those. Talking of people gaining sponsorships and social media followings, so looking at your Instagram, I see that you are very professional, you love your boxing, not just taking part, also watching, attending. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you have a close knit with your family you visit up Scotland um, you do talks with people you're, you love your music, you're a musician you do classes, you teach on Skype and Zoom um, that's your way of portraying yourself on social media that's your way of setting yourself across and showing what kind of person you are other females other people will use other methods we live in a day and age where it's, things can sometimes seem a bit chauvinistic people like to show off themselves, show what they have enhanced 
How do you feel towards females who use their body to sell in regards to tickets and gaining attention on social media? Because some females have only had maybe two, let's say under seven fights, but they've got a massive, massive, massive following. How do you feel about that? So at the end of the day, however you want to sell, get tickets sold and uh, get people to your fights is completely up to you. I think as a, as a female, it's your choice entirely. Personally, I've, when I was younger, I was massively body conscious. I was really self-conscious anyway. I was quite shy, actually. Um, so I don't like to portray the idea that my like to sell my body to get people to buy tickets from me from a business. I like to talk about other things and, and stuff that I do within my life and, and portray sort of that other side of me, my, my character, my personality. Um, but that's because I'm not very body confident and I've just never been like that and I think if, if you want to get into like your bikini or whatever and uh, put photos up and that gives you more followers which means you sell more tickets that's fantastic it's if you feel that confident that's great but I mean for myself especially um, I have a lot of young female fighters looking up to me um, and also as a teacher as well like I teach music and I teach boxing and I, I can't be seen to be in my underwear on my social media platforms even if they are for my professional page and my personal pages are private um, and I don't want to give that sort of idea that you have to it, like sex you have to use sex to sell yourself basically I just don't agree with it you, your talent and abilities and your character can also sell you as a great person so um, you know it's, it's completely up to the person it's their choice um, but I, I just personally don't choose to do it that's a, that's a good answer I, I do understand that I've seen in boxing various fighters some, some female fighters use that technique, others don't. But ultimately, um, yeah, it is branding, it's marketing, it's to get yourself out there. But in saying that, do you feel any type of way if fighters who do use that as a method get more opportunities sooner or faster or given a platform which you've had to literally bash your ass for to get? Yeah, I mean, sometimes that can happen if you've got a vast amount of social media following and you can you, people are going to buy tickets to watch you fight because you want to get in your pants. That's completely fine, but like... I know that I've worked really hard to get to where I am and the opportunities that I get given, I've I couldn't have I've not just been gifted them, I've been given them because I'm I've worked hard for them. And um, yeah, no, I think it, it it can be difficult, but like I said, each to their own. And if you're successful doing that, by all means crack on. Oh, I think that's that's fair, that's fair. So in women of course, women's boxing has been going on for decades. Decades no centuries yeah. but I, I'm, I'm only going to talk about what I know it's been going on for decades on for decades now but it only seems that in the last 10 years or so it's got most attention since it's picked up on the Olympics we've been seeing women boxing champions unified champions women headlining pay-per-views all this stuff has really only been happening more so in the last 30 years that it's picked up in a large scale I think a lot of female boxing fans or a lot of fighting fans today they aren't aware of what's happened in boxing prior to the years 20 2012 they don't know about Jane Couch no. they don't know about Chrissy Morton they don't know about Holly Holm Mia St. John Christian Riker um, how much did those guys have influence on you once you picked up boxing and have you looked into them much yeah I looked into all of them of course um, as you said I'm a bit of a boxing geek so I like to look back and watch the old fights and learn about learn about my sport I think um, that's just my nature if I'm going to do something I want to know all about it and I want to research it and make sure that I'm not missing out on any of the facts and the history and stuff um, Jane Couch has done amazing things for mm. women's boxing in this country she's a massive hero to she should be a hero to every female fighter in this country um, and uh, you know getting us the ability to be professionally uh, to get our licenses pro uh, professionally noticed by the board and all that sort of stuff it is huge you know it's massive and I think like you know you look back at Lucia Riker she, she could bang she was she could punch you know and it's exciting to watch these old fighters because they were fighting in a time where women's boxing really wasn't all taken seriously you know it wasn't really given it's the right amount of um acknowledgement for what it was because they were like i always say when people say oh it's not the same as the guys boxing i was like i bleed just the same i sweat the same i hurt the same so don't tell me i'm doing any less work than a man's doing when i'm in there i'm wearing the same little gloves i have no head guard mm -hmm. it's exactly the same thing and the danger is just exactly the same so um i think they should be acknowledged for what they achieved in, in the past and all that hard work they were doing 
And um, nowadays we're actually getting respect for all of that as well. And I think the, the previous the world title fights that have been on show for everyone to watch and the Commonwealth title as well, that it's exciting for people to see that talent coming through now. Yeah, that's a point you, you made about that. The women boxers of, let's say, 20 years prior, they were doing all the things that the women of today would, well, a lot of them were doing the things that women of today were doing, but they just weren't getting the recognition. They just weren't getting the TV no. behind them, the broadcasting, the sponsorship. They weren't getting, as you said, taken seriously. Yeah. Who would you say from the previous generations was your favorite or most iconic, or who do you think was the best female fighter of all time? Who was your GOAT? Uh, in the past, that. Like I think Riker for me has to be someone up. She has to be up there, really. Um, and I like Anne Wolf as well. Anne Wolf was. Anne Wolf always. Uh, really she was badass. Like I, she scares me now. Uh, but she's yeah. I think those two up there for me, a hundred percent. I would go. I think you know who I'd go with. Do you know who I'd go with? Holly Holm. You are right. I think Holly Holm is the greatest female combat fighter of. Um, possibly all time me, you asked me the greatest of all time for like boxing i think she's now i would class her as one of the greatest female for athlete af- combat athletes for, of all time but at the time as a boxer i would say the other two maybe i think better i oh. think now now she's amazing she's like y- you know what she's done with her body and the career she's had from boxing then to mma is just insane and she's absolutely one of my idols 100 percent I would say, still for boxing, even if you take MMA out of the subject, MMA, the fact that she's not tied Ronda Rousey like that, that just, adds, that just adds to it. But I would still say, for the boxing that she'd done, I still think it was phenomenal. I think she had about 38 fights, only lost two of them, was the undisputed champion at that time, because at that time, only the WBA and WBC had women's titles. Um, she beat everyone. Everyone that came across, she beat everyone. I think she had, most of her fights were 90 or 100. She won the North three judges' scorecards. And I think for what she done then, she just, like you said, the girls weren't given a recognition. They didn't see it as too serious. I think if she was one of those fighters, if she was around now, uh, I think yeah, it would have been a superstar, now. superstar. Same way of Chrissy Morton. Yeah. Um, Chrissy Morton was a, was a great fighter too. She was on the undercard of Mike Tyson. They were calling her the female Tyson. I think it was in this day and age with the social media, with the platform, with all of that kind of stuff. I think it would have definitely had a lot more impact and been a lot more bigger throughout the world I think so yeah but also you've got to remember as well at the time like nowadays a lot of the f- females coming through have come through Olympic an Olympic background an Olympic mm-hmm. podium sort of situation where they fought for their country and like the level of boxing like from 2012 you know when we had our, our, our fighters going for the Olympics the, the women then I think um, you know the levels of women's boxing is just risen massively because of the technicalities like they're in there sparring and training with the lads as well so the the technique is just improving and improving mm-hmm. and i think the, le- the level of ability is much much higher than it was back then mm-hmm. i think and especially and there's more kind of competitive opponents i would say i think yeah. sometimes the fights from the past that, that sometimes you're looking at the two opponents like one's a superstar one's just shouldn't be in there you know like mm-hmm. it's just a bit of a few mismatches mm-hmm. which is probably what marred women's boxing in the past because people mm-hmm. thought it wasn't really very fairly matched some of the fights mm-hmm. and uh and also like the, there were knockouts happening but was the competition mm-hmm. you know worthy of actually being in there in the first place so. no i do agree with that like uh, there are female fighters who had have their legacies and have their runs and you could question out of maybe a 30 fight career how many of these opponents actually yeah was actually a yeah a credible opponent to say the least but you can only really do what is What's in front of you of it, yeah. at the time because i looking at um right jar i thought hmm she only had two title fights uh she didn't really beat anyone she had a lot of fighters who were one and oh oh and two under 10 fights hmm but yeah that, as you can say you can only fight who's there for you at this at the time of the Absolutely. of your boxing career but yeah none the least i think all of these women have done great things they put the fighters of today okay. in an even stronger pole position to do all the things that they're doing now so we have huge respect to them for doing that as well because like they were doing it in a time when everything was against them, was against them. absolutely everything. everything even like getting even into a gym and getting training time with a coach like that was hard enough as it was um, so like huge props to, for them for striving through that time so that we can get to where we are now and um, yeah so much respect really. like I said I do think moving forward but women's boxing in the UK or across the world is definitely 
definitely been boosted has definitely had a lot of attention has definitely had a lot of stars coming up and through the ranks there's now a scene you can now anticipate fights and say i think she should fight her or her should fight her back in the day it was just we've got one female fighter <laughs> and we don't know who she's going to fight next but she's going to fight someone and that's yeah. going to be the main that's going to be the main thing that we look forward to but now we can say we've got her we've got her we've got her yeah. from across the pond and yeah it's, it's really looking interesting yeah, what so back on to you your career specifically Welterweight. The goal is now welterweight. Yeah. What do you look to get from this by the end of the year? Where do you look to be within the welterweight scene? So my goal for this year is obviously my, this is my first fight around welterweight, and then um, I'm, I'm looking for two more fights this year. Um, I want to finish the, the year with hopefully with the title, maybe Commonwealth for European or something like that. Um, and then I want to set myself up to put myself in the right position for 2022 to have a chance to challenge for a world title at welterweight. That's my goal. So as we do know, on the 13th of March, all the world weight titles, undisputed world weight title will be con contested between Cecilia Brackus and Jessica McCaskill in a rematch. Of course, they will hold all of the belts. They will probably fight at least one time this year and then that leaves 2022 open. Do you look forward to the chance of fighting either Jessica or Cecilia? Well, I personally think they've got this fight to come up just now. And I think Cecilia's got a bit between her teeth, so I think she might win this one and take her titles back. And then I anticipate there potentially being a third fight. You know, you need a third one then, <laughs> really, to decide. Um, so, but yeah, for me, I'd, I'd relish the thought of fighting either of those two. It'd be a great matchup. Um, I'm sure me and Jessica would do well in a phone box. And uh, me and Cecilia, well, I've sparred her. I was part of her, one of her sparring partners over in Kiev. Um, and I mean, I have massive respect for Cecilia. She's one of the top female fighters out there. So to get to fight, it would be an amazing opportunity as well. So for me, I don't care who's got the belts. I'm just going to challenge for them. And I want to take a world title home. No, that's, that's fully understandable. And that, you're definitely in the mix of those top level girls. You've been around the world. You've sparred the best. You've trained with the best. You've been beating some of the best. So yeah, you definitely hang in that bracket. Also, an option would be, as we know, Clarissa is fighting on the 5th of March, of course, against Declare. All the belts once again on the line. Yeah, finally. We know Clarissa's moving over to MMA. I could see her at some point vacating those titles. If she is to vacate those titles, you're coming down from super middleweight down to welterweight. Mid middleweight, from middleweight. You're coming down from middleweight down to welterweight. Of course, uh, super welterweight is still there. Could that be a possibility? Always, of course. I mean, I won my first world title at super welterweight, so it's a, an easy weight for me to make. Um, at the moment, my main focus is welterweight this year. But if those opportunities were to come up in the right situation with the right opponent, I'm always going to take the opportunity to fight for a world title. I mean, my goal is I want one of the big four. That's what I'm aiming for. So if it's a 154 or 147, I don't care. I'll take it. <laughs> Sounds like you've got a mission. Always. So you're just, you want the titles. You're chasing the belts. That's what's important. Other than the belts, are there any names in particular that you wouldn't mind getting in the ring with? Is there anyone in particular you got your eye on who you'd like a fight with or is it just business, it's just about the belts? I mean, as everybody knows, I fight anybody anywhere. Um, and I think that's pretty consistent throughout my whole career. <laughs> that's not really something you can discuss. Um, so for me, my main focus is getting one of those straps. I want one of the big four and I want it to be mine. So uh, yeah, I don't care who's in my way to get it really. There's such a great wealth of talent in the women's boxing world. So right now there's exciting people to fight. So, you know, and like I said, I haven't been to the welterweight division. So there's a whole range of people there that I've not fought either. So, um, yeah, I mean, whoever, whatever. Whoever, whatever, whenever, however, whatever belt, whoever yeah. fighter, you'll take it either way. Cool. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for your time. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. As always. Thank you. This is Scotland's Hannah Ranking, former IBO World Champion, fan out of South London, Churchill's Boxing Gym. I'm Rack Noble, this is Box Story, and we're out. <laughs>